thank you so much to our um, prospective parliamentary candidates here who've all um, come today to tell you what their parties are going to do for women should they be successful in this election. And how we're going to uh, do this is we're going to, we've asked the candidates all to um, give a presentation of three minutes and we've asked them to address these three questions. The order that we're going to have today is we're going to start with Edmund Potts. Um, Edmund Potts is the prospective parliamentary candidate for the Trades Union and Socialist Coalition Stroke Left Unity Party. Um, so without further ado, I'll hand over to Edmund. Um, well... Thanks very much. Uh, I'm very glad to be here, and thanks very much to Force of Devon for uh, inviting us to be here today. Um, I'm representing an option on the ballot paper at this election, um, which many of you won't have seen before, and it's the opportunity to vote for a socialist candidate. I'm actually fortunate enough to be represent representing two organisations at this election. One is, as has been mentioned, Trade Unionists and Socialist Coalition, which is an alliance of anti-cuts campaigners, people standing up against the bedroom tax, you know, fighting back against decreases in wages, living conditions and so on. And the other is Left Unity, which is a new party of the left. It was formed in November 2013. So I'd like to, <clears throat> sorry, I'd just like to speak a little bit about that and, and to tell you why that, you know, why this is an especially important sort of event for us. Left Unity explicitly, uh, explicitly identifies as feminist. It identifies you know, three main planks to its sort of guiding ideology, socialism, feminism and environmentalism. So obviously an event like this is, is very, very important for us. In terms of our manifesto for the coming, uh, coming five years, what we have said, and I'm very glad that the questions clearly identify that the key question facing this country and our society is austerity, and can we find an alternative to it? Will we be able to vote for candidates who will give us an alternative to just different shades of the same austerity programme? So I think that's a crucial issue. In terms of the effect of austerity upon women, it's something that we identify very clearly on our manifesto, and we've come up with a number of things that we would do. In terms of the living wage, for example, uh, obviously the Living Wage Foundation do great work and, and it's very interesting to read on their website, you know, the way they calculate it all out, you know, £7.65, I think. Um, Left Unity's policy actually is to go further than that. It says that a, ra a rather more radical measure is needed to confront the crisis of, of living standards and low wages that we're actually facing. We're calling, for both organisations that I'm representing, are calling for a £10 an hour minimum wage in the next five years. So that's to be implemented immediately, not by 2020, not in you know, some vague deadline, but we think that's something that's urgently needed. In terms of the uh, public sector cuts and the impact that this has upon women and families and, and you know, children, what we um, are identifying as key issues are things like the bedroom tax, which of course you know, hurts families disproportionately and women who, who have to you know, provide for children and you know, living in insecure living conditions. And also things like the benefit cap, which disproportionately hits larger families, so you know, families with more children. I think those are key issues. Um, and in term, sorry, <laughs> uh, in, yeah, just in, in terms of the, uh, the other things that we are focusing on, we think that the, the living wage is very important, not just because... 15. 15 seconds, OK. Not just because it's important for all workers to have a higher wages in the next period, but also that it will, dis it, it will di make, make a massive difference to women who may you know, be underemployed, working part-time, living in insecure contracts, Zero hours contracts, that's what we'd like to focus on. We're tough. <laughs> okay, I'd now like to welcome um, Diana Moore, who is the prospective parliamentary candidate for the Green Party. Thank you for your welcome and thank you for inviting me to here today. The Green Party believes that everyone who wants one should have a decent, secure job. 
And zero hours contracts have become a byword for exploitation because they're generally low paid. Employers are putting their risks onto the employees, which is stressful and it's unjust. An unpredictable income makes it hard to pay the bills. An unpredictable hours makes it hard to plan a life, especially when care of the children have to be planned for. And this puts women in an impossible situation. The Green Party would end exploitative zero hours contracts. And we think <laughs> that we, people should be paid a living wage and we should increase the minimum wage to be the, le, that living wage. So in, nine, in 2015, we would implement a minimum wage of £8.10 and by 2020, this would be £10 an hour. This would also save £2.4 billion a year in tax credits and generate an extra £1.5 billion a year in income tax and national insurance. So if we move on to childcare, as well as being expensive, childcare is complicated. It's hard to get places, especially if it's on an occasional basis or needed at short notice, which is another reason to stop zero-hours contracts. Paying for it too is complicated, if you can, and it's fine if you can get your head around vouchers and credits. I struggled with that. We need to simplify this. I'd also like to add a third point to your question. I want to see for all children that care is quality child care, care that nurtures and values our children too. And knowing this will make, mean juggling of work and family life is a bit easier. And the single most important factor for a child's development is learning at home. And we want to make sure that preschool education and childcare is equally um, treated to actually nurture and develop them so that children and parents can flourish. So we want to create a universal, high-quality early education year system, which is used by everybody. It's comprehensive, good quality, and free at the point of delivery. We would support children's centres for the very youngest children and their parents, and childcare and early education from ch and children from the age of one. We would also double child benefit from 2017 so that we could help contribute towards childcare costs for older children. So in terms of what has austerity done for women, well, private interests have ruled the roost for too long. Our society is scarred by inequalities of power and wealth, and the planet is being plundered of resources and damaged by pollution. All in it together? We don't think so. Those with power and wealth have done very well out of austerity. Britain grabs more than anywhere else in Europe. We know that women have become poorer, they're earning less, and they're overburdened and more vulnerable, and those, that is confirmed by government figures. We want to improve equality and security in a mixed economy and create a taxation system which promotes equality and sustainability. Thank you. Thank you. I'd now like to welcome... Um, Don Morris, who's the prospective parliamentary candidate for Exeter for the Conservative Party. Uh, good afternoon, and, and thank you for having me here today. It's been a fantastic day. Um, I've dipped in and dipped out of sessions, and particularly Anne Daniel's session this morning was just fantastic in, t in seeing uh, what a, a female-led um, female team's expedition to, Arctic, to the Arctic can do um, and in redressing gender equality. Um, my name is Don Morris, I'm the Conservative candidate in the upcoming general election in 47 days time, not that we're all counting. Um, my background, uh, I started out in the Air Force uh, and was a, a terrible pilot but actually had to leave because uh, I got really quite ill and I that was a really um, life-changing experience for me. I moved home with no job and no reason to get out of bed in the morning and started working for the Prince's Trust on the front line of the welfare state and really didn't like uh, what the welfare state was doing to young people. It was trapping people in independ dependency rather than lifting them out. Um, I got a little bit better and still had an itch to go and work in conflict zones, so I uh, worked in Afghanistan, Pakistan uh, and uh, later in the Middle East, Syria. Um, and one of my proudest professional moments was running a team of 150 Afghanistan staff in Western Afghanistan and hiring some pretty impressive um, Afghanistan women, giving them their first job amongst some pretty um, terrible intimidation. Um, today I'd like to talk about three things. Um, the need uh, and what's driving us to get more women into better paid jobs, uh, the efforts we've made to uh, support men and women in a, in a balanced family life, and finally, uh, women in politics. Uh, at the risk of being overly positive, we've made some incredible steps towards uh, steps forward on gender equality. In, 
in the last six months before the Conservative-led government got in, the wheels were falling off our economy. In extra alone, 2,000 people were made redundant um, in the largest peacetime recession uh, since the Second World War. And under the last government, uh, women's unemployment rose by 30%. Um, since then, the Conservative-led jobs miracle has seen us create, as a nation, more jobs than the rest of Europe put together. And we're now the fastest growing economy uh, in, in the developed world. But this jobs miracle has helped women disproportionately. The gender pay gap is now at its lowest levels since records began. There is now a record number of women in employment, more women than ever before taking a pay packet. Women under 40 now for the first time earn more than men. There's a record number of women starting up businesses um, and leading their own businesses, and more women have been appointed to senior positions. The number of uh, women on FTSE boards has doubled since 2010. Um, we have, uh, we've cut taxes. We've cut taxes from the bottom up. It's, it helps um, people's uh, living standards, and uh, 1.5 million women have been taken out of tax altogether. Um, I'm sorry I've run out of time, but I'll uh, answer some of it in the questions. Cheers. Um, I'd now like to welcome Penny Mills, who is uh, the prospective parliamentary candidate for Plymouth Moorview for UKIP. Thank you. Thank you very much for inviting me here today. Um, I will address the three questions, um, not necessarily in the same order. Um, we're not out and about on the political campaign or in hustings. I work for an environmental charity, and at one stage I was one of only six um, women to run the county branch out of 43. I'm actually the only female um, candidate in Devon for UKIP. Um, I've worked long hours, and I'm happy to do this as I'm committed to the environmental campaign that I'm involved with. But if I worked out my hourly rate, I'd be working for a fraction of the minimum wage, and I'm sure there are many other women committed to a particular cause that this is also true for. My husband has a small business. He only pays himself once all the bills are covered and his staff are paid. Sometimes business is good, he can pay himself something, sometimes not so good, and he can't pay anything to himself, sometimes for several months. But his staff are always paid well, above the minimum and living wage, and are paid far better than he needs to to be competitive. Why? Because it's a moral issue. In terms of business, it's the wrong decision financially. So like many women and households, I know how it is to struggle some months to balance a budget. It's for this reason, and the plain evident unfairness, I'm personally and my party is totally against zero hours contracts. We would end them. It's impossible to budget when you don't know how much money you have coming in. The issue of a living wage is interesting. Its calculation for the Living Wage Foundation includes a minimum income standard for the UK. In many ways, the minimum wage and the living wage should be one and the same. However, a figure for the UK outside London is a very crude tool. It doesn't take into consideration all kinds of regional and local factors. For that reason, UKIP seeks to address this in a different way by hiring the level at which taxation cuts in. We propose raising this to 13,500. One of the cruelest and most disgraceful cuts of recent times has been in the area of disability and the ATOS style assessments. I've got an 85-year-old relative with a pacemaker, high blood pressure, arthritis, and she's disabled. She can't walk except with a Zimmer frame. She's housebound. But she's had to be reassessed, and her carer coming in for one hour a day on weekdays has now been cut to two hours a week and she's lost half of her disability allowance. Her condition has got worse, not better. It's ridiculous. I've got a colleague in Plymouth. He was blinded in one eye in an industrial accident years ago at the docks. But every six months, he has to go for one of these assessments to identify if his vision in his glass eyes improved. We would scrap those sort of style assessments. We would also scrap the bedroom tax. It's totally unfair. OK, right. <laughs> Uh, that was 15 minutes to go, but thank you very much for being so brief um, uh, uh, on that. Right, well, I'd now like to um, introduce Stuart Mole, 
who is the um, uh, prospective parliamentary candidate for um, the Liberal Democrats in East Devon. Thank you very much, Chair. And let me deal with the three-part question in, in stages. First of all, women's employment and a living wage. Uh, I think all employers should pay the living wage, uh, and the point has been made that it's very important to lift people out of in-work benefits uh, rather than expecting the state to bridge that gap. Liberal Democrats would take those on the minimum wage out of tax altogether and continue to uprate the minimum wage uh, above inflation increases, and I think the Labour Party's 2020 target is a good one in that respect. Uh, there are more women in work than ever before, 14.4 million. It is an increase of 839,000 since 2010. There are more women-led businesses and more women on uh, FTSE boards, a doubling of that rate. Uh, the gender pay gap is narrowing, um, but I accept absolutely that it is not good enough. And in particular, I know the Fawcett Society has looked at self-employment in that regard. The Liberal Democrats have recently in government achieved the legal requirement for pay transparency in businesses with more than 250 employees so that we can really see where the problems uh, remain. Secondly, affordable and accessible childcare. The cost of childcare is a huge problem for working couples. In governments, uh, the Liberal Democrats have fought for three early, free early years education for three to four year olds up to 15 hours a week, and to hundreds of thousands of two two-year-olds as well. From this autumn, almost two million families could benefit from a, tax, a new tax-free childcare scheme worth up to 2,000 pounds per child. We've also achieved the very important principle of shared parental leave, and we want to close the gap for working parents by extending free childcare from the end of parental leave until two years of age. Thirdly, the question of uh, the impact of cuts on women and children. Liberal Democrats entered the coalition to help pull the country back from an economic crisis and return to growth and prosperity and to balance the books. But we also believe in a fair society and in providing opportunity for all. By next month, the flagship Liberal Democrat policy of raising the tax threshold will have brought 3.4 million workers out of income tax altogether, 58% of them women. We've extended free early learning places to 40% of the most disadvantaged two-year-olds, introduced the pupil premium at a cost of 2.5 billion, and made free school meals available to pupils in reception years one and two, saving families around 400 pounds a year. We'll protect the health and education budgets, and we'll make the better off pay more, including through a mansion tax. Thank you. Now I'd like to welcome Ben Bradshaw, who is the, uh, our current MP um, for um, Exeter, and he's standing again for the Labour Party in this coming election. The main reason I joined the Labour Party was because of the Labour Party's commitment to equality, and it seemed to me as a young man growing up that most, if not all, of the meaningful legislative advances towards equality, not just on gender, but on race and on uh, sexual orientation, had been achieved under Labour governments or under pressure from the Labour Party. That was my motivation. And I think it's uh, irrefutable, uh, if you look at all of the independent research that's been done on the impact of this government's policies, whether by the Fawcett Society itself, by the in Independent Institute for Fiscal Studies, by organisations like the Roundtree Foundation, that the disproportionate impact of the government's austerity policies have fallen on poor people and they've fallen on women, particularly women with children. Whether you're talking about <laughs> cuts to tax credits, the freeze of child benefit, the uh, ex explosion of zero hours contracts. So what would Labour do? Well, first of all, Labour would ban exploitative zero hours contracts. Uh, we would increase the minimum wage to at least eight pounds in the next parliament. We would incentivise organisations and companies to pay the living wage. Exeter's Labour Council already pays the living wage, at least the living wage, to all of, it, all of its staff. 
and we do so by requiring any company or organisation that wanted to bid for a public contract that they had to uh, offer to pay the minimum of the living wage to their employees. I'm extremely pleased that if Labour wins the election, we will, for the first time in history, have a cabinet, the majority of whose members are women. I'm also extremely pleased that in the local council elections this year in Exeter, we will almost certainly, unless things go disastrously wrong for my party, be the first ever political party in the country to achieve gender, more than gender parity on the leading group. So the leading Labour group on Exeter City Council will be majority women. <laughs> on childcare, we would extend free childcare for the parents of three and four year olds from the existing 15 hours to 25 hours a week. We would also extend uh, breakfast and after school clubs, which still present a real challenge for women, women and parents who are trying to balance work and child responsibilities. We would extend maternity and paternity leave uh, as well. And we would not embark on a massive further austerity programme, which is what is now threatened by the Tories if they get back in. Bigger cuts in the next two years than anything we've seen in the last five, and they will not be able to be achieved without a further assault on women, the poor, and particularly those people in work on benefits. The majority of people on benefits are in work, and it's those people who've been hit most by the coalition's policies. Thank you, Ben, for ending with 15 seconds to spare. Thank you.